Hi everybody, Professor Steve here, and uh, let's wrap up ocean circulation by finally bringing the um, how the surface uh, ocean circulation uh, comes full circle. Um, so to recap, we learned um, about Ekman transport, right? We learned that uh, the the prevailing winds, or even the short-term winds, which we'll talk about actually at another time. Um, can transfer their energy through friction, through an interface with the water, the, the ocean surface, or any water surface. Um, and when it transfers its energy to that, it pushes the water along. And the sum of the effect of Coriolis on a large body of water being moved along, right, this is described by the Ekman spiral. Um, but essentially the net effect is simply to move that body of water at a 90 degree angle to the right of the wind that's pushing it. All right, so if we have wind going in in this direction, we have water transported directly at a right angle to the right in the northern hemisphere, and that would be to the left in the southern hemisphere. If we apply that to our global prevailing wind patterns, um, which always travel from these high, la high pressure latitudes to the low pressure latitudes, right? Flow always goes from high to low. It has always deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere, left in the southern hemisphere. That pushes on the water this way, which drives the water to the 90 degrees to the right of that wind, right? Same thing from here to here in the prevailing westerlies. Whoops. This way, right? Um, and we get the same thing occurring in any large open space of ocean, right? But this is this is supposing a, a um, one giant global ocean with no continents. Well, if we take that that um, phenomenon, right? If we take those characteristics now and place them within an ocean basin, so the ocean is um, <clears throat> essentially perimetered by by the continents, right? So we have our our winds going here from our um, subtropical high to the equatorial low, and then we have our winds going from here from the subtropical high to the whoops to the polar low. We get the winds going this way, water going that way, right, to the, to the right, 90 degree angle to the right, winds going this way, water going that way. So this water um, along this whole section is traveling this way, but eventually piles up over here and, and hits continents, right, hits shallow um, ocean bottom and hits the continent and wants to curve this way. And this water over here, uh, um, in this section is continually going this way but eventually is going to pile up and hit continent over here and so it wants to curve over this way and so what we ultimately get is this large gyrating and and the word gyrating is key here um, this large circular gyrating pattern of of circulation in in this whole section of ocean All right so <clears throat> What happens when we have this, the, the, the overall, if we add up the overall physics that set up this phenomenon, what does it look like? It's very similar to a high pressure system, and, and except on a very, very large scale, ocean basin wide scale. And indeed, we, we do get those characteristics that set up. We do actually get this high pressure center set up here, right? This is Coriolis now. Um, um, balancing out with with pressure gradients, and and what we get is a gigantic geostrophic flow that sets up. And indeed, I I anywhere these gears set up across the ocean, we do get a bulge. We get a high spot in the ocean. It's not flat there. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But this whole pattern is called a gyre, right? This gyrating pattern, this circulatory um, pattern, this circular pattern of circulation is called a gyre. Okay, ocean jeers, and there's many of them. Um, <clears throat> it's it's obviously not just that one big circle. Um, you know, it sets up a whole bunch of other currents around it, um, driven by winds or driven by the jeer itself, um, and it happens to to varying uh, strengths in different parts of the jeer. Um, you can see we could have smaller patterns set up in some places. Now, to really understand how it sets up. Um, we'll just quickly revisit Coriolis. Um, Coriolis, the the equation that describes Coriolis, um, changes with respect to the radius um, of the distance traveled. Um, Coriolis is an acceleration, which means it's speed um, per distance times distance, which makes it subject to the radius of the distance traveled. 
Uh, you don't need you to understand that, but what I do need you to understand is um, what I mean by that is, so we talked about the circular deflection of a path being stronger at the poles and weakest at the equators, actually zero at the equators, but because of this radius, that's, that's the strength of the circle, of the deflection of the path, the arc. But it's not the strength of the apparent, I mean, of the actual force, the Coriolis force. So if you're traveling from, if you want to travel from here to here on the map, the Earth has to turn further, um, or you have to change your, your radius of your target um, more for somewhere near the equator, because it has to travel further than you do up here. And so that makes the force actually stronger there, right? <clears throat> so just to kind of put that in a different way, if we just look at this blank globe and we have a gear going here, right? Up here, the Earth has to turn less to make that complete um, it, to make that complete um, rotation. So the angle of deflection is a lot stronger, right? What we mean is the curve, the circle, is smaller. Is what we really mean. Down here, the Earth, the the the, the um, radius of the Earth is much bigger at the equator, and so it has to make a much bigger turn. Um, so when you have that larger radius, you have an actually larger effect in terms of the force, right? So at the top of the gear, um, Coriolis has a weaker effect than it does at the bottom of the gear as it gets closer to the to the um, to the equator. So and what I show is actual in t in um, in terms of strength of the of the currents in this gear, right? I show I depict that in a smaller arrow, a thinner arrow here, and a larger arrow here, right? So the f so the flow is actually slower up here than it is here. What's the overall effect of this? The overall effect is that the water is slower here stronger here so it's always piling up over here it's like a bottleneck and the overall effect that happens there is that it shifts the gear this way right the, the water that 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 high pressure center is is um is actually sh not in this directly in the center but it's shifted off to the left because we have a high flow of volume going here but because this is going slow up here it's like a bottleneck and it all piles up here so what does that make when you have isobars that are closer together over here it means the actual currents are much much stronger um, on an eastern boundary of a, of a gear than they are in the western boundary here we have very far apart and if we look at if we look at a cross section through here, so if we take a slice through here and look at the sea surface level, like this, it actually looks like this. Okay, so here would be North America, here would be Southeast Asia. If we look at the, and this is actually obviously an over exaggeration of the shape, but <clears throat> the the uh, the sea surface actually piles up, bulges, as we shift towards the the eastern boundary or towards Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And this happens in all gears. And on the opposite side of that gear um, um, in the southern hemisphere. Right, so we get it in the north, we get it in the south, and the overall pattern, if we look at the map, so this is a very large simplified version of, of what it all looks like. So we get these these giant gears in the northern Pacific, the southern Pacific going the opposite direction, right? Um, we get it in the northern Atlantic and the southern Atlantic, and we get them anywhere um, anywhere there's a big enough ocean basin to, to set up this phenomenon. Here in the in the Indian Ocean, um, and then we have, and this is what I mean by an oversimplification of it, right? So we have, here's our, our North Pacific gear going this way, here's our Southern Pacific gear going this way, here's our Atlantic gear going this way, our South Atlantic gear going this way, North Pacific, South Pacific, here's the Indian gear going this way, and these guys act sort of as gears and motors, and they, they spin this way and that way, and, and between these and the winds, they set up all these other currents in here. Some are very strong, when the closer the lines are together, you can see how uh, um, the stronger the actual current is. <coughs> But if we look at these in terms, so if we colorize these for the for the water that they transport, right? We uh, we we now have a little bit of a picture of how the surface ocean transports heat. Um, so anything coming from the north, any of these currents that set up come from the north are obviously colder. Any of these currents obviously coming from the equator are obviously warmer. So they throw heat around as well. 
just like the thermohaline circulation. So it is these patterns together with thermohaline circulation that actually does the majority of of the global heat budget balance, right? So if we add the jeers, the surface ocean circulation with thermohaline circulation, then we get pretty much the global um, heat balance. Now the last thing I want to show you um, is a little interactive um, app on the web. So when you go to your when you go to our website and you're doing the surface current lessons, um, below that I have I have this link. And if you click on that, it'll take you to this interactive app that I want you to try out um, that really gives a good example of all the things that I just described. Right? So it'll, it'll tell you what we're talking about. We're vi visualizing a single parcel of water as it moves both through thermohaline circulation, and then you can click on and off the, s the surface circulation, like the jeers, and see how it would, how it would, um, how it would uh, integrate into that. So here we have thermohaline circulation. You see the dot is blue, so this is a parcel of water, and as it gets towards the surface, it's warm water, right? Just like we described in thermohaline circulation. So here, right here, we have deep water formation, travels the depth along the seafloor, and either surfaces and becomes warm in the Indian Ocean, or at least the majority of it does, or it follows a track and makes it to the surface in the Pacific Ocean, right? But now what happens if I turn on this North Atlantic Basin? We see that the water can also, when it's traveling in the surface, be entrained or caught up in this secondary um, ocean circulation pattern, which is the jeers, right? So it warms and cools and warms and cools. Um, and eventually, we turn this off again, goes all the way north and becomes part of deep water formation, right? And the same thing can happen in the Indian Ocean. Oops, I missed it. But the same thing can happen in the South Atlantic. Same thing can happen in the North Pacific, right? When it surfaces, it can get entrained and caught up in this North Pacific jeer and warm and cool and warm and cool, bringing cold from the north, bringing heat north from the from equatorward and eventually end up back in the large scale thermohaline circulation. Okay, so it's two different large scale layers of circulation um, that the ocean travels. And it's when you add all these up, sort of the longest paths all together, that we say we get roughly a thousand years that it takes for the, for the ocean to circulate. So I want you guys to give that a try. Um, and um, and let me know if you have any questions. See you next lesson.